Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron, this is Scott, and today we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. All right, so we are going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do a couple episodes here and there this season, really working through a um, verse-by-verse study of the Gospel of Mark. We've kind of done that already with, like we just did it with Habakkuk, the Old Testament minor prophet, where we went through all three chapters and two lessons, kind of verse by verse. Um, But we want to do that same thing with the Gospel of Mark. Um, There's four Gospels. What are they, Scott? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's right. Which ones are the synoptics? Matthew, Mark, Luke. There you go. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Yeah, who who, who doesn't know that? Well, someone who's never heard it from someone else. That's That's true. So Very true. you got to keep on going. That's true. Every generation. What What does synoptic mean? Oh, man. Sin together and... Yeah. Opt, opt to see together because yeah. they like parallel accounts. Yeah, it's amazing how much you can figure out about what words mean just by understanding some of the roots. Yeah, totally. Um, so in the Gospel of Mark, which is what we're going to look at, we're going to go through and do a little bit of a, a background introduction study today on who John Mark was and who wrote this gospel according to Mark and how do we know and et cetera. And then uh, either this episode or the next episode, we'll get into like chapter one and verse one. Mark has 16 chapters. It's the shortest gospel. What's the longest one? What's the longest one in chapters? Starts with an M. Well, Matthew. What's the longest one in content? Starts with an L. Luke. <laughs> Great. That's good. Which one has the most miracles? Uh, Mark, probably right. Does it? I don't remember. I thought that would be John, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I didn't count before. I never either. I just assumed John, I guess. Someone who knows that email These us. things are written that you might believe. You know, it's, yeah. it's really directed more at people. I know that Mark Needed has 21 of 39 miracles. Yeah. I just have it written in my Bible. So. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. Drop it in the comments. That's right. Someone <laughs> someone email us. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead That's and count. It. Count them for us That's in the emails. It. Tag so, us there, please. So Gospel of Mark. All right. Who's the author? Mark. Tr- trick question. No, it's not really. There's multiple the right Spirit. answers. Yep. God. Yep. The Father. Yep. Who gave words to Jesus. Yep. Who spoke them in the places where he's quoted and then gave words to the Holy Spirit to bring to remembrance the other things to the apostles. Yep. I don't know. And then Mark wrote it down, the inspired writer. No, we you're right. Ex- we could exhaust that. No, I agree. You know, but- well, if you look like in go, let's do some look let's do some looking. Go to John twelve forty nine. Read John. 1249. So John 1249 says this. Let me find it. For I have not spoken on my own authority. This is Jesus speaking. But the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So Jesus got his message from God the Father. And then Jesus basically said he was going to give his message to the Holy Spirit who would give it to the other Bible writers. Go to John yep. 16. You got John 16? Read John 16, 12 through 15. It says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So John twelve forty nine says that Jesus got his message from the Father. And then Jesus said, basically, the Holy Spirit's going to speak what he hears, what Jesus tells him to speak. He's going to glorify Jesus. John 12, 16, 12 through 15. And then he's going to guide you the apostles and other inspired writers in the first century into all truth. And then, of course, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 talks about all scripture being God-breathed. Theonustos. It's Tucker's favorite word. Theonustos. Um, Theonustos. I don't know and, how to say it. Well, we practiced it. Tucker, we practiced yeah, it Yeah, I mean, we're episode. basing it off of a made-up pronunciation anyway. Well, the Rasmian. Well, just go ahead and ruin all our fun. Hey, man. <laughs> Good at that. (laughs) So um, Scott is alluding to the fact that no one really knows, I guess, the proper way to pronounce it because it's based off Erasmus. It's a a locked dead language. So we can never know, which is sort of not really depressing. I'm just kidding. But there is a standardized way of pronouncing it. That's true. That's true. So basically you have this idea of, I don't know if they call the hierarchy, but God the Father gives the message to Jesus. Jesus, when he ascended, was going to, so the Holy Spirit is going to come and give that message that Jesus gave, John 16, 12 through 15. 
And then the inspired writers would write it down. So who's the author? Well, God is the author. Yeah. You know, I've said this before. There was a guy once that wanted a Bible. I was talking to through Instagram and he didn't have a Bible. And I said, I would send him one. And he said, does it have the words of Jesus in red? And I said, uh, I don't, I don't know if it does, but I can look. He's like, well, if it doesn't, I don't want it. And I was like, well, I think you're kind of, you're not quite understanding the process of inspiration, which is everything in your new Testament is inspired because it came directly from God, the father to Jesus through the Holy spirit to the inspired writers. So the ultimate author is God, but who is the human author or the penman, the gospel, according to Mark, Mark, right? So who did the Holy spirit inspire to write this book? Yeah. And the author, believe it or not, if you go through the book, guess who's not mentioned? He doesn't actually mention himself. He doesn't identify himself. So it's not like in some where it says, I, the writer, I write this with my own hand. I'm Paul or something like that. Okay. So the question then becomes, well, how do we know who wrote it? Um, One way is if you look through early writers, early Mm -hmm. church writers, history, they all attributed it to Mark. So I've got some quotes in my notes that rhymes. I've got yeah. some quotes in my notes. Um, got some quotes in your notes. Quotes in my notes. Um, you could do one of those remixes. So Papias, right? Mm-hmm. 60 to 130 AD. He said that Mark wrote his gospel in Rome. And he said that Mark or John Mark, he's also referred to in the scriptures, was Peter's interpreter, his amanuensis, his mm-hmm. secretary. Basically the one that wrote stuff down. I'd love to get one of those. <laughs> hey, write this down for me. Right. Um, Irenaeus said the same thing about Mark being Peter's interpreter or secretary amanuensis justin martyr in 150 uh in dialogue with trifo he wrote this it is said that he jesus changed the name of one of the apostles to peter and it is written in his memoirs okay so peter his memoirs that he changed the names of others two brothers the sons of zebedee to boanerges which means sons of thunder so what justin martyr is saying 100 years after jesus is he's basically saying that jesus changed the name of one of the apostles and he basically said that to Peter, it's written in Peter's memoirs that he changed the name. But if you look that up, that's Mark 3.17, which if you put those two things together, it means that Justin Martyr thought that the gospel of Mark was the memoir of Peter, right? So what does that mean? If you read about the other early writers, Clement of Alexandria says that Mark, John Mark, was a follower of Peter who wrote down the things that Peter preached. So it was the idea that John Mark followed Peter. And you know, like how you have people saying Matthew was the gospel to the Jews. If you look at early church history, they say that John Mark was spending all this time with Peter. He was like Peter's, you know, secretary, like his little Timothy to Paul, right? Eusebius said the same thing. Um, Tertullian said, while that gospel, which Mark, Mark published, may be affirmed to be Peter's, whose interpreter Mark was. And then Origen, another early church guy. Um, let's see. Eusebius quoted a gospel commentary written by Origen that explains the origin of the gospels. This is what he said. This commentary attributes the gospel of Mark to Peter. In his first book on Matthew's gospel, maintaining the canon of the church, he testifies that he knows of only four gospels, writing as follows. Among the four gospels, which are the only indisputable ones in the church of God under heaven. So early guys said, hey, guess what? There's four gospels, not a hundred like people want to say. I've learned that the first was written by Matthew, who was once a publican, but afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ. And it was prepared for the converts from Judaism and published in the Hebrew language, right? Argue about that. The second one is by Mark, who composed it according to the instructions of Peter, who in his universal epistle acknowledged him as a son, saying, the church that is in Babylon elected together with you salutes you, and so does Mark, my son. Uh, 1 Peter 5.13, and the third by Luke, the gospel commended by Paul, because Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, and composed for Gentile converts, last of all that by John. So they're basically saying that these guys were inspired, but this is who like their traveling companions, who they were close to, right? So the fact that they were close to those apostles makes sense probably, I mean, where they got spiritual gifts, you know, laying on of whose hands? The apostles. The apostles, yeah. First Acts 8, 18. So if you look as far as like, well, you say that's tradition, like that's not inspired. Yeah, obviously I get that. But there are some textual things in the book that sort of support that. Peter is the first apostle called in this book. That makes sense if Peter is, if the, the account is basically, you know, connected to Peter. Um, and it seems like Mark would write his experiences from Peter. But either way, whether you like that or not, the gospel of Mark is what? Starts with an I, ends inspired. Yeah. Inspired, right? So who is John Mark? Let's look at that. Um, what is his connection to the apostle Peter? Um, you got your New Testament ready? Yeah. Look up First Peter 5.13. All right. First Peter 5.13. First Peter, obviously written by right. Peter. 
she who is in Babylon, elect with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. So he calls Mark his son, right? Mm -hmm. Son in the faith. Okay, not literal son, but so you can see that Mark and Peter have a close relationship. Right. In Acts chapter 12 and verse 12, go to Acts 12, 12. This is kind of cool. I think it is. Um, let's see. Acts 12, 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John. This is Peter after he escapes from prison. He came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. So he came to John Mark's house, right? Where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood by the gate. They said to her, you're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting it was so, and they said, it is his angel. So I assume that they think, well, Peter's dead because Herod just, you know, Herod Agrippa, I believe, was just killed James. And now he has Peter in prison. So they're thinking, what's going to happen to Peter? Well, he's going to be killed too. And basically an angel gets him out of prison. He goes to John Mark's house and the servant girl recognizes his voice, which means he's what? He's at least spent some time there that the servant recognizes his voice, yeah. right? So um, go to Mark 14, 51 through 52. This is sort of an interesting thing. I don't know that I could prove it, but look at, this is basically the account of the arrest in the garden when Jesus is arrested. And some people are like, what is this relevance? Read Mark 14, 51 and 52. All right. <clears throat> now a certain young man followed him, say, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Okay, so this is someone else that's in the garden with the apostles when Jesus is arrested. And there's a certain man following him, Jesus. And some other young men grabbed a hold of this person who had these linen, this linen cloth. And he basically like broke free from the linen and sprinted away naked, right? And so most people are like, what does this have to do with anything? Like, who is this? Some people think, is this a, is this a young John Mark? And he's writing about this experience. I don't know. That's about the only thing I've thought of that makes any sense. I don't know. Maybe there's someone else. If you're watching and you got a better explanation as to why that's there, send me an email. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. You know? Yeah. Like what What else would that relevance, would that be there? Yeah, I don't know. Is that John Mark saying, well, everyone else ditched him, but I stayed with him. You know? Mm. All right. John Mark had that connection to Peter. He also had the connection to an apostle named Paul. Um, Paul was converted in about Acts chapter 9. He retells his conversion in 22 and 26. In about Acts 9 after his conversion, Barnabas, son of encouragement, took Paul to the apostles. And so then Paul and Barnabas become traveling companions, right? Um, and if you look at Acts 13.5, look at who was their assistant. Go to Acts 13.5. Acts 13.5. And when they arrived in Salamis... They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. All right. So Acts 13, first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas leave Seleucia and they sail across to the island of Cyprus and they arrive in Salamis, which if you're watching, hey, Kith, it's good to see you, man. Hope you're doing well. Kith is a guy that was just baptized in Cyprus at his college, which is like a mile from Salamis. So it's yeah. pretty cool. So hi, Kith. Um, and high rod in Victoria too. Hello. That's who flew over from Israel to, yeah, to uh, go I study. Remember with him. Hearing. Okay, cool. So they arrived in Salamis, where Kith lives now, and they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John, John Mark as their assistant. So John Mark goes with Paul and Barnabas. I always want to say Silas, that's later. Paul and Barnabas, and their assistant is John Mark. All right. Look at Acts, you're in 13. Skip down to verse 13, though. Acts 13, 13. Okay, I'm there. Okay, read it. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from there, returned to Jerusalem. Okay, so they sail from Paphos, they get to Perga and Pamphylia, which I think is the mainland, and for some reason, John, John Mark, he departs from them and returns to Jerusalem, right? So I don't know why he leaves them. The Bible doesn't really give us any information. It doesn't seem to be a good reason, because later in Acts 15, go to this, go to Acts 15, verses 36 through 39. Okay. Acts 15, 36 through 39. This is the second missionary journey. All right. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take them take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. 
And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Okay, so when you get past the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, John Mark's with them, he leaves them. He departs them. Obviously not for a good reason, because when you get to Acts 15, they're thinking about going on a second trip. Paul and Barnabas are talking about it, and Barnabas wants to take with him John Mark, who Colossians 4.10 says with his, was his cousin, right? So Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So Barnabas wants to take his cousin. I don't know if he's a younger cousin. I don't know. I sort of feel like he might be, but that could be wrong. He wants to take his cousin, John Mark. And Paul says, no, no, no. Last time we took him, he basically departed with us. And Barnabas seems to be upset because they have a sharp contention that they basically decide to separate and both do work on their own, right? And so Paul took the land route, went up through Syria and Cilicia, and Barnabas took John Mark and they sailed to Cyprus, which I think, yeah, Acts 4, 6 says Barnabas was, was a Levite of the country of Cyprus. So that's where Barnabas was from, was Cyprus. So he takes John Mark and they basically sail back to Cyprus. So he's kind of giving his cousin, I don't know if it's a younger cousin or not, but he's giving his cousin John Mark like a second chance, right? And so they'd been through Cyprus on the first missionary trip. I was getting mixed up. So Barnabas takes John Mark and they go there again, right? But you see later that Paul sort of switches his position on John Mark. Yeah, it's such a weird irony. Yeah. In a way, I never really thought about it much, but Paul and Barnabas arguing about giving John Mark a second chance. Well, and you know what? I don't. Who brought Paul to the apostles? Barnabas did. It's kind of, that's what I was saying. Well, it's kind of an irony in a way. You also never know, too. Like, maybe he realized that later. Well, and Paul may say, Paul may say to Barnabas, like, let's say John Mark repents and says, I I shouldn't have abandoned you. I want to go again. Yeah. And Paul probably said, Look, I don't deny, like, I've forgiven you. It's okay. But, like, I don't have time to deal with it. You know, like, I don't know all the details, right? I don't, I don't think, either. I yeah. don't either. I don't think Paul's sending it. I think that, no, like, I, don't think that. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I think, mean to imply that much. No, no, I didn't. Th- I don't think he did. I was just yeah, being yeah. clear, but just, clear, just to make sure I'm clear too, to for clear, the record. Clarify. I don't clarify. think that Paul sinned in not taking it. No. I just, you know, I just, just disagreement. Really about it. You yeah. Know, it's just interesting. Sometimes you disagree. It's not. That's why Barnabas you know. is the son of encouragement, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's what yeah, that's, he's known for. That's right. That's right. In Acts 4, he's the one that sold his property, yeah. gave it to the church. Yeah. Bar, son of, Nabas, encouragement. Yeah. I think. I know Bar, is, so I'm assuming, I mean, son of encouragement. So basically, if you go to, go look, go to um, Philemon 24, right? I'll lead, you read 2 Timothy 4.11. 2 Timothy 4.11. I'm going to read Philemon 24. So Paul, in the letter to Onesimus, titled Philemon, he says, uh, verse Philemon 23, it's only got one chapter. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. So by the time he writes this, you've got John Mark. He's calling him his fellow laborer. And then 2 Timothy 4.11, this is when he's in prison, right? And he basically says, everyone has abandoned me. But look at what he says. Read 2 Timothy 4.11. What has he said about John Mark at this time? End of his ministry. And 2 Timothy 4.11? Yeah. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for ministry. So you have Mark who does a missionary journey, abandons him. Paul and Barnabas argue, no, 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 for whatever reason, we're not taking him. And Barnabas says, no, I'm going to take him with me. And they say, fine, well, I'm going to take Silas. We'll go different ways. They part ways, but then later you see John Mark sort of is, gets this redemption in 2 Timothy, or yeah, 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul says he's useful. And I would say, how useful? You're about to read a gospel that he penned through yeah. inspiration. So I think it's kind of, this is not only a story of sort of redemption and second chances for John Mark, but ultimately, I mean, he's a gospel writer. So you yeah. see that sort of story throughout the book. So it's pretty cool. Um, location of writing. Yeah, lots of early writers argue about that. Date. Lots of them argue about it. Some early, like Papias said the church at Rome wanted Mark to write this to remember Peter by. So I think they would be saying it's after his death. But um, Clement and Eusebius said Peter was alive when Mark wrote. So it doesn't matter because either way, he's, he's inspired. Um, and Irenaeus yeah, actually, the particular timing of it doesn't no no it's like late 60s early 70s affect. yeah I mean even earlier than that the fact of the matter is you can argue about it all you want you don't really know but we know it's it's first century yeah it's first century it's inspired yeah. right so um, it's written this is something I think is important it's written with what audience in mind I read that quote earlier I think it was origin where it talked about the purposes of the different gospels or whatever and um, 
it's, it shows that Jesus, basically, I, my summary is he's shown of a brave man of action, a swift moving king, okay? So most people think it's written to Gentile Roman audiences. Right, we're going to Mark 7, okay. 2 through 5. Why do most people think it's written to a Gentile or Roman audience? Well, go read Mark 7, 2 through 5, and listen to how this Jewish custom is explained. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Wash their couch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've done that before, but I don't do that yeah. very much. It's only when like my kids spill something on it. <clears throat> Maybe that word means something different. I don't know. But... Basically, you have this Jewish custom that's explained. Well, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it's obviously not written to a Why Jewish do you audience. To explain it, or else you wouldn't have to explain. You know, in Mark fourteen twelve and Mark fifteen forty two, it says the preparation day, which is the day before the Sabbath. A Jew doesn't need you to explain that, right? Mm -hmm. It transliterates a lot of Latin terms like denarius and centurion. It translate translates Aramaic terms, and Aramaic and Hebrew are really similar, so you wouldn't need to do that for Jewish people. So, you basically got a lot of these things that point to it's written more to like a Roman Gentile sort of audience in mind. Um, it's full of power and action. Jesus flips tables while cleansing the temple. Doesn't really reference the Old Testament as much, like quoting, like Matthew would, quoting Ooh. the Old Testament to show he's the Messiah. Um, it doesn't have a genealogy, like Matthew or Luke. Yeah. Doesn't talk about the virgin birth or his childhood years. And so, it basically just jumps right into a man of action. Um, one great way to study, we're going to do another lesson on just ways to study and tips and things that we like. Um, doesn't mean it's the best way or it's just the way we've, you know, over the years, I guess, been accustomed to studying. But one way to, a good way to study is to find the key words, right? Mm -hmm. I don't mean like the and 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 if. I mean like, you know, the Greek words, lemma is what they're described. Sometimes it's not, a, you have a root and a lemma. But anyway, you can like color these in. You can highlight them. If you sometimes highlight key words with different like highlighters, or, I mean, I use highlighters. Some people use color pencils. But you know, you can really sort of see this, I guess, theme that's running through the book. So when you look through Mark, you see this idea of a fast moving king. That's if I had to describe anything, it's fast moving king for the book. You see straightway, I have immediately healed or straightway 42 times in the gospel. See, like with your eyes, 99 times. Uh, what the word hear, akuo, which means hear and obey. 52 times, kingdom 32 times, faith, follow, and authority, right? So if you want a list of keywords, um, uh, Bear Valley actually has a resource on their website where uh, I'll actually, I'll link to it in the podcast resource page. But basically, I think they have, uh, it's a document that has, I think, 27 pages, which each page has a, the keywords for um, each New Testament book. It's like the keyword. Awesome. It's in Greek, though. That's good. But, you know, it'll still give you the verses mm, where it still. is. I mean, yeah. So sometimes you might be a little confused because you're like, this word is, you know, knowledge in Second Peter is used 16 times. I only count 14. Well, it's based off Greek keywords, but it's easy enough because they give you the chapter and the verse. So mm -hmm. don't be don't be scared away by that. So it's easy to see this is like a key word. So it's like, okay, well, if I'm writing an email and I use the same key word five times or five times another one, I use 50, you can tell sort of what one of the themes is. Yep. So, all right. Um, we already talked about being the shortest. All right, here's a here's a structure. Um, 16 chapters. The first eight are basically establishing who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. And then from the second half, 9 through 16, is sort of retraining them about what the Messiah actually was sent to do. What, what did the Jews think the Messiah was coming to do? Bring them to a place of glory in the world. Yeah. Um, beat back the Roman oppressors establish a fine kingdom that no other would ever rival or had before. And, uh, you know, yeah, that kind of idea, like very material, physical supremacy. You're right. And so it's confusing to them after the first eight chapters, he just miracle, 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 like 20 miracles maybe. And, the demons are confessing him. All these things are leading him to the conclusion that he's the Messiah and they're expecting this physical Messiah that's going to restore the physical kingdom of David and Solomon. And so basically once they find out he is the Messiah, then he starts telling them that the Messiah is going to be betrayed by men, scourged, crucified, killed. 
And they're like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not what the Messiah is here to do. The Messiah is here to make us, bring us glory and put down Rome, right? So you see in the first eight chapters, he's showing them that he has the proof that he's the Messiah. And then the next eight, he's showing them what that means. It's kind of yeah. like re, re, like reframing it for him, you know? Yeah. So see. we'll see that as we go through the book. Yeah. Another interesting thing to keep track of is what some people call the messianic secret. You know what? No, nah, what's no, nah, I haven't heard that. What as we read through the book, secret? okay, notice what Jesus is going to do is he will do a miracle and then tell the people that he healed, Shh, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone oh, who I, got I am. You. Yeah. You know, he tells the demons to be quiet, but I get that. He he doesn't want them to be Yeah. He don't want a you know witness. Sometimes you don't want someone to say, Well, I know who that guy is. Well, so you're a bad witness, just be quiet. Yeah. But Jesus seems to like work miracles and tell people, don't tell anybody. So I, why why is that? I don't know. There's lots of theories. The ones I have in my notes, the idea of John 7, 8, my time, my timetable hasn't fully come. So mm -hmm. is it like God's providential timetable? Enough to, I don't know. Another one is that basically the Romans are going to see Jesus as a political threat. All theories. I don't know that I have a one I'm really set on yet. But basically he's trying to keep the word, the quiet down because it seems like it's, I think probably the, the one that if I had to pick one, it'd be this one that Mark shows the growth of the crowds. So if, if you go through, just to go through like the first two chapters in Mark 128, immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. Mark 132 and 33, the whole city was gathered at the door. Mark 145, you're not even through the first chapter. He couldn't publicly enter a city. Mark chapter two and verse two, no longer any room near the door where he was teaching. So you have like by Mark 320, like two chapters in the book, there's crowds following him that he can't even eat a meal. And there's 5,000 men, including women and children, probably 10,000 people in the wilderness with him. Like the crowds grow so fast. And I wonder if he's saying, look, I don't need to try to spread my fame. It's going to spread that fast anyway. Yeah. So he's telling people, shh, don't tell anybody. And yet his fame and fortune, fortune, fame and following just gather, grow, grow so fast, you know? Yeah. 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 So I think that probably in regard to that, my personal opinion is like you said, that go reference that verse. I mean, that's it. Yeah. I, I don't think that it was his time. I think there was a certain time that God had set aside before the foundation of the earth. Yeah. He was going to be on that cross in that yeah. moment. It, it was going to come at that specific moment for a reason. Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness you know, of time. All of those things had to be fulfilled. And yeah. when he sat on the cross, he said it is finished. It, you know, I, I think that, I think that's it. It yeah. needed to be at that moment. That's good. That's great. That's yeah, I don't opinion. know. I mean. It's just my opinion. Well, yeah. I mean, and we're going to study through it. and Yeah, we'll, we'll come. We'll go look at that. Yeah. And you can disagree with either one of us or you can disagree with I one of them. It doesn't I'll, matter. Maybe I'll look like an idiot by then. Well, you know, I've been wrong before. Yeah. You can ask my wife and I'll be <laughs> wrong again. Yeah. But sometimes there are positions that are better than mine. So I get rid of that old one and take a new one. So, all right. Yeah. Anything else before we wrap up the introduction? No. Thanks for hanging with us on the, that was intentional, the big head swing like that. Thanks for hanging out with us on this episode of The Authentic Christian. This is the introduction to the Gospel of Mark. Next time, we'll take a look at Mark chapter one and verse one. Start working our way through the book verse by verse. Thanks for hanging with us. We'll see you back on the next episode. See ya. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network, or GBN for short. You can hop on the App Store, search Gospel Broadcasting Network, and you can download the app. And there's this show, many other great shows that you can watch or listen to and start learning more about the Bible and uh, why we're here, what our purpose is. Thanks for listening.